So out of all the different tree frogs, there's one group that really captivated my interest, and that was the leaf frogs. You can just imagine seeing one of those in the wild. It's just incredible. You know, they're great. Their eyes open. They've got all bright colours all over them. They're just an incredible family. But 25 years ago, there was very little known about these, these frogs. And out of all those leaf frogs, there was one in particular that nobody knew anything about. And it was very, very rare. It was the splendid leaf frog. I was on a mission to find this frog. It took me five years to find the first one. And, and it was incredible. You know, that was my frog, that was one I want, really wanted to work with. I got special permission to collect them, brought them back to the museum. We bred them for the first time in the world, in Manchester. Um, I did my thesis on the frog, described its biology, um, the tadpole development. That had never been described before, and it really became my frog. People often think of museums as kind of dead spaces full of all this dead stuff. But actually the museum is, is live and, and not least a vivarium which is full of live animals. So it's the heart of what we do and sharing that with the public in really compelling ways that are going to capture their imagination. Frogs are naturally very sensitive species and the frog species that we're working with are extremely rare and endangered. So it's really, really important that we take extremely good care of them because when they're gone, they're gone and we're dealing with a very small population already. When we talk about museum collections, natural history collections, insects, mammals, birds or other collections, basically specimens themselves represent physical proof that this particular species occurs on that particular part of the earth. Therefore, we need to keep them in order to, show, to, to, to prove that this specimen definitely occurs there. There was actually another species that was very closely related that actually lived in the Amazon area. After studying the splendid leaf frog, I really wanted to find that one. So I went all the way to Ecuador, South America to actually look for that particular one. But while I was there, I came across another leaf frog that didn't fit with either of them. Straight away I realised that it was different. You know, seeing, seeing something like that new, it was just mind-blowing, really. That's the only way I can, I can kind of put it, really, is that it just blew me away. It was like magic. But obviously I couldn't collect it at the time. I didn't have permits to collect it, so I had to leave it where it was to actually think, will I be able to come back and find another one or will I ever see this frog again? I think that was, that was the worst, really, thinking, well, I've got to take a photograph of it and I know that it's different, but there's nothing I can do about it at the moment. Last year, I was able to get some from Ecuador and when I got those specimens, it was just, like, it was just magical seeing them. These were the ones that I'd found. This was exactly the same as the one that I'd seen in Ecuador that I knew was completely different from the splendid leaf frog. And it just rekindled everything. If you want to describe a new species, you need to fix a specimen which becomes a standard of this particular species' names. It's similar like we have a standard of weight, standard of length, standards of various measures which are kept in metronomical institutions. And here in Natural History Museum, we keep standards of scientific names. When you name something, it's always possible for people to disagree on what that thing is. And by having a permanent record in museums of these specimens, we can always sort out disagreements because we can actually look at what someone thought a species was when it was described. Without specimens like this type, we wouldn't be able to describe new specimens because we wouldn't have anything to compare them to. And that's essential to understand what different species are. So in order to describe the new species that I found in Ecuador, I needed to be able to, to compare it to the original specimen that was collected over 100 years ago that was named the Splendid Leaf Frog. That specimen was actually located at the British Museum. And when I went there and I got the type specimen of the Splendid Leaf Frog out to compare it to my new one, I actually realised that they were the same. Everything changed because it had already been described. The one from Ecuador was the Splendid Leaf Frog. And it was incredible just to have that realisation at the time that actually the one everybody knows, the one I've been working with for so long, was the new species. It's almost been like a mystery, thinking, well, how can this confusion have happened? And delving into museum records, trying to find out 
exactly how this has happened. It turned out that there was one specimen in 1927 which was collected in Panama. It was taken back to America and they said that this frog was the same as the one that was brought back to the British Museum. It wasn't. It was a different species, but at that time, nobody compared the two. So over the years, more have been collected in Panama, more have been collected in Costa Rica, and they've all been compared to the one that was took back to Harvard. Nobody's actually compared them one-on-one -on -one with the actual type specimen. I guess until I came along and then was able to do that, saw it by chance. So these two frogs that look completely different now, when we see them together, have been confused for over 100 years. It's amazing that of such a large animal, with all the science that's gone on in these areas, that these could have been confused for so long. So it is, it's kind of ironic that, that this species that I know so well, that I've focused my career on almost really, and, and it's, it's, I know inside out, all the time that frog was a new species. It was just like, I still can't get over it now to be honest with you, it's just amazing that actually the one that everybody knows, the one that's in the books, the one that I've been working with, I've been able to name as a new species. It's just amazing. Taxonomists, they actually are baptizers. Before, before you, you name creature, this creature cannot be talked about because you don't know what, what, what it is. So you need to know its precise scientific name. When you know it, you, you can talk about this species and you can present it to the wider audiences. You can talk about conservation. You can talk about habitat preferences. You can study its biology when you know the name. Naming something, naming a new species and finding a new species is something that is, is every zoologist's dream, really. And with this frog, it just meant so much to me. Um, my granddaughter means so much to me, my first granddaughter. Um, it just felt right that it was, it was to be named after her. And so that, you know, when I disappear, she'll still have that. She'll have that for, for her life, you know. She, she'll be able to um, be proud that, that she's got a frog named after her, and it's a beautiful frog. Separating these two out has meant that the original Calcara, for the one that was, you know, the one that was originally collected in 1902, over 100 years ago, is actually a lot rarer than we ever thought. What was thought to be a species that had an occurrence all the way from Ecuador right the way through to Honduras has suddenly had its distribution halved. This frog is extremely rare. There's less than 50 ever been seen. So, you know, a review is required now to actually assess the requirements for these species. It needs to be protected. Given the current extinction crisis, especially among amphibians, we have no idea how much we're actually losing at the moment. So being able to identify all these species, it gives us an actual chance of being able to save them. You know, if you don't know what you're losing, how, how are you ever going to conserve it? What's all this stuff for? What are all of our collections for? They're for understanding. They're for learning. They're for us to really inform how we want to be in the world, what actions we want to undertake to care for the environments in which we live. And for me, this story absolutely brings all of those together. Most people think, you know, that preserved specimens are locked in a cabinet and that's it. But these specimens are just crucial for the future, for, for understanding the biodiversity that we have around us today. We kind of owe it to the people that have collected those specimens a hundred years ago to preserve these specimens for the future and make the most of them, make them relevant to what we're trying to do today.